Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. A new way to tell an old story. St. Louis is an arts town. It's time for everybody else to know. I just like the work. It is fun to get up in the morning and go work on something. Today on Spotlight, a new weekly collaboration between HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. And then a new activity for visitors at the Arch, why this project took over a year to complete. Plus a cosmetic anti-aging laser treatment that could prevent common forms of skin cancer. But first, meet an acclaimed St. Louis sculptor who recently earned a star on the St. Louis Walk of Fame. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. At the end of a long gravel road in the woods of Warren County, Missouri, Harry Weber sits in solitude, giving a bear some relief. Artwork is work, yeah. And for more than a quarter century, the work has been steady. Harry Weber grew up in St. Louis, studied English, art, and drama at Princeton, and served with distinction in the Navy during the Vietnam War. When he returned to civilian life, Weber started working as a marketing consultant, but he always felt himself drawn to something else. I draw all the time. My wife and I were both professional horse people, and somebody asked me to do a sculpture of a foxhound, and found out, yeah, that's pretty easy. I enjoyed doing that, and that's where the sculpture started. The big break was the Cardinals in 1997 started those statues outside Bush Stadium and asked me to do them because I said, you know, the, you, you may find more accomplished sculptors, but you're not going to find anybody that likes movement better than I do and what moves better than a ball player. Weber went on to sculpt dozens of busts for the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame, along with the iconic Lewis and Clark statue on the St. Louis Riverfront the Chuck Berry statue in the Del Mar Loop, and the statue of Dred and Harriet Scott in downtown St. Louis. I like sculptures that portray the veracity of a moment, you know, both physically and emotionally. You try to imagine what's going through their mind at that moment and try to capture that. And that, that's what makes it fun. The problem with it is sometimes you get working on things, and I think this is true of musicians, writers, or anything, you almost get hypnotized by your own work. And you think, oh, you know, this is great. I'm really moving along here. Then you walk in through the door the first thing the next morning and go, oh, God, you know, how did I fool myself into doing that? And you basically start all over again. As of 2023, Harry Weber has created more than 150 sculptures displayed in more than 100 public locations. Half are in St. Louis, and those numbers continue to grow. I am an octogenarian. Saying you're 81 has a lot more panache than saying I'm in my 70s. No thoughts of retiring, no. Uh, thoughts of just getting more work, right? I like to eat. <laughs> we had an eight month period with nothing to do. And I was beginning to think, well, you know, my career is over. We had proposals all over the place, requested from people. And then all of a sudden, six hit at once. So I'm working on six big things. And that's the way it works. It's, you know, peaks and valleys. But that was, that was a pretty terrifying valley for a while. And now there has been an exhilarating peak. On June 21st, 2023, Harry Weber was given a star on the St. Louis Walk of Fame. I often say that I live in the reflected glory of my subject matter. And it is true that they don't do statues of dull people. It makes an interesting job even more interesting in that I've gotten to know or know about more than a hundred of the more interesting people that ever existed on the planet. I was amazed, I was astounded. Here I've made a career of honoring people, and I get honored for honoring people. It's, it's great. It's a super turnaround. 
For his service in the Navy, Harry Weber was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor. Now he's been awarded a Brass Star for being, in a manner of speaking, a Bronze Star. I just like the work. It is fun to get up in the morning and go work on something. And it doesn't matter if anybody else recognizes it or not. The real trick is to know when you're doing your best work. The real trick is to know when that thing that you just did meets your standards. I don't care about anybody else's. Of course I care about what they think, but the main one is, am I pleased with it? HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys, Tellys, Natoas, Auroras, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hcmedia.org. History Spotlight, brought to you by HEC Media and the Missouri Historical Society. Hello, I'm Dr. Jody Sowell, President and CEO of the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis. The Missouri Historical Society and HEC Media are teaming up to bring you History Spotlight. Each week we will introduce you to the people, places, and events that have helped shape our city's rich past. The 1911 St. Louis Cardinals became heroes while traveling to Boston for a four-game series when their train derailed and they sprang into action. Public historian Adam Cloppy tells us how. You know, baseball is an incredibly popular sport around the world, in the United States, especially in St. Louis. And people talk all the time about what role athletes should play. Should athletes be role models? It's hard to argue with the fact that the 1911 St. Louis Cardinals can serve as role models for people. In 1911, the Cardinals weren't having a particularly great season. They were doing better than they had in about a decade, but they still weren't a great team by any means. But off the field, one day they're traveling between Philadelphia and Boston for an upcoming game. And they're traveling by train overnight. Their car initially is supposed to be pretty much right behind the engine, but the manager of the Cardinals, Roger Bresnahan, he argues that, hey, my guys need rest, they're playing in a game, can we move our cars to the back of the train? And the conductor, you know, complies with that, moves the cars to the back of the train. They're all sleeping in their car, and then as the train is going through Bridgeport, Connecticut, the train derails, and there's this huge accident. Dozens of people are hurt, almost 50 people are injured, 14 people end up losing their life in this train accident. It's this horrible, horrible thing. But the Cardinals' cars had not really derailed. Everybody in there is fine. They're jostled around a little bit. And Roger Bresnahan, the manager of the Cardinals, he realizes that these guys have a duty to help the people that are hurt. So he, he wakes up all of his guys and he says, we got to get out there and start working to save people. So these guys run out into the night you know, into this train wreck. They're mostly wearing pajamas and they're helping pull injured people out of the wreckage. Some of the guys end up finding axes and tools and chopping up pieces of the wreckage to help get people free. There's public health officials who said that without the efforts of those Cardinals players, a lot more might have succumbed to their injuries in this train accident. That it was really the actions of this team that helped a lot of people survive. We can talk about whether we should look up to athletes for their role on the field, but again, it's just hard to argue that the role that these Cardinals took off the field isn't something that we should all look up to. Next week on History Spotlight, we will share the story of the country's first black female millionaire and her connection to St. Louis. To learn more about the Missouri Historical Society, visit mohistory.org. Go to hecmedia.org for the arts and authors. Completely accidental because I never set out to write a book. Science and history, culture and community. It's considered to be the oldest organic farm west of the Mississippi. Education, 
favorite films. Finding the coin places the site firmly in the 13th century. What's happening now around St. Louis and more. See for yourself at agcmedia.org. Margaret Fuller, Anne O'Hare McCormick, Pauline Frederick. Recognize any of those names? Author and journalist Brooke Kroger introduces us to the inspiring women of the last 180 years who pushed open doors for female journalists of today. Whose names keep coming up over and over again? If someone writes a book on the 25 most important women of the 19th century, or the women writers, let's say, what names keep recurring that are also journalists. Mm -hmm. So those would be some of my keys. But someone like Dorothy Thompson, who's probably a name you don't know anymore because people have forgotten her. She was, you know, the it girl of the 1930s and 1940s. I mean, the, the level of her popularity, of her wealth from journalism was just extraordinary. She wrote a column for the Herald Tribune and then had radio shows, et cetera, and became extremely important as an analyst and columnist often on, almost always on world affairs or mm -hmm. important domestic affairs. So there's a point where in one year, she is profiled by both the Saturday Evening Post, which is just about as middle brow as you can get, and the New Yorker, which is just about as you know, up there high brow as you yeah. can get. Both, not, not one issue, but two consecutive issues of each magazine. Now. That tells me I have to talk about Dorothy Thompson. So things like that would happen. And then I had ideas that I thought were in some ways more important than the stories. So the stories are often about women you've never heard of and wouldn't have heard of. You know, wire service reporters, people like me, you know, the people that, that aren't in the public eye so much. But um, the things that happened to them stood for what was happening in the decade to others. So when people say the book is encyclopedic, I say, no, 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 it's not a bunch of mini profiles. The stories are advancing the stronger thread, which is this extraordinary continuum of what I like to call progress, setback, progress, setback, push, pull, push, pull, right up to the present. What I thought was interesting, too, is it wasn't that they were just reporting on things. They were changing the way that people were reporting on things. Everybody. Right. right? It's true. Um, you know, I'm, it's not that they were setting out to change things. Some of this happened by circumstance and happenstance. So, for example, getting women into the field, like into those newsrooms in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, how did that happen? There were women who wanted to and were extremely talented. A++ talents, who were also very savvy networkers. So they would do things like write for the abolition press. The abolition press wasn't very wealthy, right? So they needed talent. Well, they were willing to look more widely for talent than where you usually looked, which was to white men. And so by getting their copy in there, well, everybody was reading it. So then from there, these women of the 1860s catapult to writing for the Atlantic, for the New York Times. So very, very smart strategy. With your perspective, when you look at newsrooms today, what is it that you're hopeful for? What we hope is that they survive, because that's the big issue of the moment. The crisis in local news is horrific, and of course that affects women and men. I think the book has a lot of cautionary tales. I think the book is really an advice column for young reporters, you know, where you're looking at some of these stories and you're going, oh, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And some of the women who've gone very high in leadership and what's happened to them are, I think, really interesting cautionary tales. So I, I thought that was an important thing to include, uh, very much so. Anyway, I just think it has a lot of contemporary resonance that, you know, could make you a little smarter when you go about thinking about building a career. To find out why COVID affected her research and why she did not choose to talk about any new journalists, watch the full interview at hcmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hcmedia.org. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. We are currently in the lower tram lobby at Gateway Arch National Park in the visitor center. 
And behind us is the new virtual reality theater. We are offering a brand new activity for Arch visitors and we're really excited. It's very popular and it's a different way to tell stories. When a visitor puts on one of our 3D headsets, they are transported back to the 1850s to the St. Louis Riverfront, which was at the time a very, very bustling area filled with dozens of steamboats that brought in travelers and goods from around the world. So it was really an embarkation point for westward expansion in the U.S. And the visitors will be immersed in the sights and sounds through what they see and hear through the headset. This production was very complicated. It's more than a year in the making. We hired a company called Time Looper out of New York that creates these 3D experiences. It involved shooting actors in costume and creating virtual sets, i.e. the riverfront is, a, is really a set, and telling a story as it moves along. We have traditional storytelling methods here at the Arch. We have a lovely museum that tells a lot of the story of both the history of St. Louis and of the United States. And those techniques are wonderful. Some are interactive and people can read and see artifacts. But today's audiences often look for something a little more high tech, especially kids. And we thought virtual reality, which is really what we're delivering here, is a new way to tell an old story. Many visitors come to the Arch, they just expect stories about the building of the Arch. They don't ask themselves, why is the Arch here? And it is here to commemorate the vision of Thomas Jefferson, who had the uh, idea of exploring the Western United States, but also of the many pioneers, mountain men, enslaved people who helped build this country. So the museum tells many of those stories. Someday we hope to have many virtual reality productions that tell additional stories of why we're here. This story brought to you by Educate.Today. Noah Miller Ludlow was a New York born actor, producer, and theater manager who dominated the theater scene in St. Louis, New Orleans, and Mobile, Alabama in the mid 1800s. Noah was introduced to a St. Louis newspaper publisher who told him that St. Louis, even though it was such a small town in 1819, it was lacking for entertainment and that the people really wanted theater. And so uh, he made up his mind that he was going to travel there and, and um, establish the first permanent professional acting company. He established the Old Salt House Theater when he was first in St. Louis. Eventually, another theater company moved into town and he said they were more experienced um, and just did a better job. So he was only able to do that first season back in 1819. In the 1830s, Ludlow would return to St. Louis and try one more time to follow his old dream. With better funding, Ludlow opened the St. Louis Theater in 1837. The St. Louis Theater was very popular overall, especially the first several seasons did really, really well, and St. Louisans flocked to this new entertainment. Many of the country's most popular actors also flocked to the St. Louis Theater. A big one was Julia Dean, who performed in the 1840s. We also know that uh, Junius Brutus Booth uh, performed there. He was a major tragedian of the day, and he's also the father of John Wilkes Booth. The St. Louis Theater had its final season in 1851, and after that the building was sold to the federal government. But another theater opened up right nearby, so the tradition continued immediately. As far as Ludlow's story, he continued to be in the theater world for decades. And in 1880, he wrote a book that was part biography and part accounting of how theater came to the West and the South of the US. Looking to inspire the young innovators in your life with some summer learning? Check out our educational website at educate.today. Encouraging people to enjoy the arts, later on Spotlight. 
and the laser will make a beeping sound and that tells me that we're delivering like appropriate amounts of energy. Dr. Baja Maholsky recommends this laser treatment okay. for a few cosmetic reasons. To treat brown spots on the skin, also for facial rejuvenation, decreases pore size. Fraxel laser is a non-ablative fractionated laser, which means that it's not breaking the top layer of skin. It's delivering all of its energy into the dermis, which is that second layer of skin right under our epidermis. Maholsky is an assistant professor of dermatology at Washington University School of Medicine, and she's a dermatologist for Washington University Physicians. So I went one, two, three, four. We need a total of eight passes for a full treatment. The non-ablative fractional laser is performed by dermatologists, or it may be offered at a plastic surgeon's office. This is called the Fraxel Dual. So the Fraxel Dual is the name of the laser, and the Dual refers to the two wavelengths of the Fraxel. So there's a 1550 nanometer, um, which goes a little bit deeper, so it's delivering energy into the deep dermis of the skin. And so it's targeting those deeper acne scars or those deeper lines and wrinkles, you know, improve the texture of the skin. The 1927 nanometer laser, that's a thulium laser and it's targeting water, and the idea is that it helps kind of pull those brown spots off the skin, so good for facial rejuvenation. How are you doing? Great, thank you. Dr. Maholsky says the laser has added benefits. Also been already studied for treatment of precancers, and so it does treat precancers as well. The next step was a study out of Mass General Hospital. It was published in 2023, so just a few months ago, and it was one of our laser experts in the country. The small study by a team of researchers at Massachusetts General Hospital suggests the laser treatment may help to prevent the development of common types of non-melanoma skin cancer diagnosed in the United States. But I do tell patients about the study because I think it's, it's interesting. The study reviewed the records of 43 skin cancer patients who received the laser therapy and 52 skin cancer patients who did not have the laser treatment. The skin cancer patients typically have a 35% risk of developing new cancer within three years and a 50% risk of recurrence within five years. So patients who did not have the laser treatment had a 2.65 increased risk and over two-fold or two times increased risk of skin cancer compared to the patients who did have the laser treatment. That's the exact rhythm that I want. The study that was recently published showed that the Fraxel dual treatment can both reduce the risk of precancer, so actinic keratoses, and it can also reduce the risk of non-melanoma skin cancers. The idea too of like why does it reduce your risk of skin cancer, it's possible that it decreases the mutational burden of our skin. So if we're actually removing small fractions of the skin, maybe we're reducing the overall mutations on the skin surface from photo damage or from sun. And if future studies with the laser treatment show more success preventing skin cancer, Maholsky wants to know the specific procedural guidelines for effectiveness. But I would be curious to know is in the future, what laser setting do we need to use that truly reduces that risk of skin cancer? Because there are two different wavelengths that kind of combined everything in this study, um, but it's a really important first step. For now, Maholsky says telling her patients about the possibility of cancer prevention helps them feel better about choosing the cosmetic procedure. It is exciting and it's something that I, I do mention to patients as an added benefit. I wouldn't necessarily market it as a treatment for skin cancer at this point. St. Louis is a world leader in cancer research. The first cancer genome ever sequenced anywhere in the world was done here. Local startups are playing a major role. If you just say, what are we working on in St. Louis? It's pretty much everything. Developing diagnostics and treatments, making strides right here in St. Louis. We can use that information to train the immune system on what they need to seek out and destroy wherever it is in the body. For the latest cancer research studies and clinical trials taking place in St. Louis, search the Cancer Research page at hecmedia.org. So stlouisarts.org has been a labor of love and we've been really, really excited about it. We launched this April 1st of this year 
And it really was because we listened to all the artists and arts organizations in St. Louis, and it was clear that they felt like we didn't have a central hub for all things arts in regards to tourism. So when we launched this website, it also coincided with a really big marketing campaign. You know, we really wanted to target people that were art-minded, people that love the arts. They love going to festivals, they love going to museums, live music, theater. But we also wanted to hit some of those spots that people don't always think about when you think about the arts. Things like comedy and dance and design, architecture, because all of these things are important and they're all part of the arts. Our goal is to show how St. Louis is filled with arts and culture. In St. Louis, arts.org promotes St. Louis as an arts town, not only to our city, but to the nation. So together, although someone may not travel from another state, another country to visit just camp, they can plan a vibrant, art-filled, culture-filled, week-long vacation right here in St. Louis. We get our funding from hotel and motel taxes in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. During the pandemic, no one was staying in hotels. And even now, as we recover from the pandemic, we're still not seeing the amount of people in hotels that we did before the pandemic. What we need to do is encourage more people that have never come to St. Louis, that have never experienced the arts in St. Louis, to come here and check us out. The more hotel stays we'll get, the more tax dollars we get, and the more artists and arts organizations that RAP can support in the community. So we just gave away four and a half million dollars to arts organizations and artists in St. Louis. So by using stlouisarts.org to bring tourists to town, you know, it's going to help our artist community. It's going to help our arts and culture sector, and that's so important to us. I think with the team at Regional Arts Commission St. Louis, what they did with the stlouisarts.org is, is really inspiring because they took an organization that's been around for a long time and they rebranded it to attract that younger crowd. People are starting to see St. Louis for what it is and, um, and since being exposed to the Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis, I've figured out all these littler organizations all throughout the city that make up that huge art scene that makes St. Louis an arts town. While stlouisarts.org very much is about bringing people to St. Louis from outside of St. Louis, we don't want to ignore the people that live here. How many people have not seen a show at Stray Dog Theater or Moonstone Theater? We want to change that. And this website is a huge part of that. We are so grateful for the Regional Arts Commission for taking a holistic approach to their website development because arts extend into every part of our life. We know St. Louis is an arts town. It's time for everybody else to know that St. Louis is an arts town. Go to our website, stlouisarts.org, and come see what you've been missing. Next week, the first female African-American self-made millionaire. Plus, how chess and music intersect and how many musicians use chess. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.